it really is good to be home. And it's good to be with, here with my Twitter friend. <laughs> <laughs> because long before we got to meet each other this evening, we have been keeping up with each other on small devices. Exactly. Um, That's the way it happens now. Yes, yes. <laughs> so it is, it is so wonderful to, to be able to um, get the story behind Hidden Figures. And I will try to anticipate some of the questions that, that you all may have in the audience. How many of you have seen the film? That's a lot of people. How many of you have read the book? OK, so I encourage you. I came out with a stack of books, as you see, because my mother and my cousin are in the audience, and they gave me their books to, to bring on stage. <laughs> so, my mom is right over there. And she said, get a signature. So. <laughs> so I love that you found the I in history. You were able to tell this story because it was so personal to you. Did that make a difference in the way that you were able to render this story? That it wasn't just, you were writing about people that you saw at the grocery store growing up. These were members of your community. Did that give you a different responsibility in writing the book? And did it allow you to write this book in a much more personal way? Uh, I, yeah, I think there's no question that um, the first thing you feel is a greater sense of responsibility. Um, because, you know, these are people that know where I live, they know where my parents live. Um, <laughs> you know, these are people that I knew growing, growing up, and it's one thing to tell your own story. It's another thing to take responsibility for telling someone else's life. Um, and so from the very beginning, I certainly felt a tremendous sense of responsibility. Um, but I also, you know, there were, there were bits and pieces of the story that I was able to fill in because I had grown up there and because I knew not just these women, but the community they came from. You know, there were things that you couldn't find in a document and con connections that you would have made simply because you couldn't remember that, that things were any different than, than in, this, in the story. So um, I, I think that that was, that was also something that I was able to, to bring to that. And even this idea of NASA, which, you know, I mean, I grew up, the first like, children's Christmas party I went to was the NASA Christmas party, because they'd have these Christmas parties with the NASA Santa and, you know, some... <laughs> What did the NASA Santa look like? He, uh, he, like, he looked like? he looked like, you know, your standard Santa, but, you know, he probably, you know, knew how to work a slide roll. That's the <laughs> difference. Um, and so, but there, you know, I think there were things like that that I just grew up with that, um, that it sort of just flowed very naturally into the narrative and allowed me to, to close gaps where there may have been gaps. You know, I always have believed that history finds the right conservator. And this history fell into absolutely the right hands. And you could not have possibly have known that when this book and this movie arrived, that it would arrive almost like a tonic, a balm for this moment where we need to see an example of people working together. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that we don't, we will not get there if we don't all work together. Uh, and I wonder, you, you talk about looking beyond, which also could have been the title for the book in some ways. It could have been. What do we as a society need to do to look beyond in sort of a big way so that we understand the, the right equation for creating access and opportunity for all? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a great question. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's something that Katherine Johnson told me. I mean, she's, she's actually told many people. Um, it's something that her father said to her when she was young. It's like one of the first things her father said kind of a, a, a philosophy of life, really. And so when you ask Katherine Johnson, who you know, I, I saw a month ago, like she's still this amazing, brilliant, you know, tremendous person. And still so elegant. It's just, you know, just, you just, you, you know, we will never be in 20 lifetimes as elegant as Katherine Johnson. <laughs> she is, she is just, a, just an amazing person. And, um, you know, so people have asked her, listen, how were you able to do what you did? You know, you're this black woman in the segregated South. This is, uh, a, you know, a little bit of pressure. You know, you're telling your bosses that you can, you're gonna do the math to send the guy into space and bring him back safely. And she always reminds you, it's one thing to send him out into space, but you gotta bring him home. <laughs> How did you get the confidence to do that? 
And she says, well, it's really easy, you know, because everything's easy for her. It's like hard for the rest of us, but you know, things are very easy for Katherine Johnson. And she said, it's really easy. It's just like my father told me, you are no better than anyone else and no one is better than you. And you know, she says that and you're kind of like, okay, let me, you know, you are no better than anyone else. No one is better than you. She's like, that's what my father said. And that is what I brought to this job. You know, and what that meant was not only did she have the confidence to go in and expect that she was as good as everyone else there, but it also gave her something else, which was really the expectation that other people would see in her the excellence and be able to treat her as she should be treated. You know, she always brought that generosity to her work and the workplace. And I think that, you know, I've spent so much time thinking about that, that her father gave her, you know, which was a gift, and that she gave me, which is a tremendous mm -hmm. gift. Um, and I think that, that there is a lot to that, this idea that there is common ground, that there is common humanity, that we can find overlap, and that we can give each other that space to be generous and to be civil and to disagree without demonizing. Um, and so that, that is one of the things that I, I, I take a tremendous amount of hope from that. Um, and uh, As do we. It, as, it's, it's really, but that, that, is, that is one of, you know, if you can call it a secret because it's, you know, we can say that, it's a mantra. It's, but it's kind of a secret. It's Katherine Johnson's, it's one of her secrets. And to it's so simple, success. right? It's, it's very simple and yet, it is extraordinarily dif difficult to put into practice. I want to peel back the layer a little bit and talk about how you were able to do research. And you have said that you are so thankful for black newspapers. Absolutely, yeah. Because if not for the black newspapers, the Pittsburgh Courier, which featured that wonderful spread on Katherine Johnson early, um, news newspapers like that that were telling these stories when the mainstream legacy press at that time was not paying a lot of attention to this it would have been much harder for you to do this work. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of the black newspapers and how you, how you did the research to really be able to put the finer point on some of the, the really the small details in these stories? Yeah, you know, it, it wouldn't have been just harder. It would have been impossible to do the work without the black newspapers. The black newspapers cataloged even, you know, tiny details of black life. Um, I found Mary Jackson's wedding announcement so when you read in the book and you you're, ask yourself, well, how did she know what Mary Jackson was wearing at her wedding? Well, I actually did wonder that. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it in the Norfolk Journal and Guide, of course, you know, um, which, is, which was one of the major black newspapers. It was the primary black newspaper for, uh, for Virginia, for Southeastern, you know, that part of Virginia. Um, I, you know, so, for example, Katherine Johnson, she was the one who told me about Dorothy Vaughn. I had never heard of Dorothy Vaughn. Mm -hmm. um, my father really didn't know Dorothy Vaughn because he was still very early in his career when she retired. And so Katherine Johnson said, oh yeah, Dorothy Vaughn, she was the head of the West Computing Group and she was the smartest person I ever knew. <laughs> so <laughs> when Katherine Johnson says that, you listen and you take notes, so I did. Um, and then, you know, I, fortunately, the, the journal and guide is digitized and online. You can, you can search all of the archives from 1919, I think it was uh, started being published. So I put Dorothy Vaughn into, you know, the search box and out comes, you know, a lot of output, but among that was uh, just a tiny little article from December 1943, the first week of December 1943, saying, Mrs. D.J. Vaughn, uh, math teacher at the high school, this was in the Farmville, Virginia section, math teacher at the high school has left to take a job at Langley Field. And when I read that, I, you know, I nearly fell on the floor because I knew I had found the beginning of my book. Like that was the beginning of the story of you know Dorothy Vaughn leaving her home in Farmville during World War II to take this job, and and that simply you know that would not have been possible um, 
without the black press, which, you know, which maintained also something called the double V campaign. Mm -hmm. um, double victory, a V, you know, really, really to create enthusiasm for the war you know, among the black community. Um, two victories, one victory over America's enemies abroad, the second victory against prejudice and discrimination at home. And so that was really the spirit that these women brought to their work, serving their country and really serving our country's truest ideals. And holding those tenants, that was part of the Double V campaign also, is we were fighting for democracy overseas and really forcing people to question whether we were making true on that promise. If we were really, really believing in democracy here at home, that was the question. Right. Uh, you talked to some of the scientists who work alongside these women, and I wonder what those conversations were like with the wisdom of time and living in a very different America now. If they talked a little bit about regrets or memories or you know what they brought to that conversation, the, the people who worked alongside these women, who sat at a different area in the mm -hmm. cafeteria, who left and walked into a very segregated America as soon as they left the confines of Langley. What did they tell you? Well, first the thing that they always said about these women is that they were so smart. You know, I mean, this is, that was really um, just uniformly the respect for these women, their accomplishments, um, the work, the, the work ethic that they brought to their jobs. Um, that, that was absolutely without fail um, something that, that they mentioned. Um, but, you know, particularly among, I would say among the white women who worked as computers in those early days, um, there was definitely, um, you know, I think especially from women who came from New Jersey, there were a lot of women who came from the New Jersey College for Women, um, other places, um, did express, you know, regret or, you know, explicitly talking about um, their, their feelings, or, you know, about the segregation um, that the women went through at that time. That they weren't able to develop friendships or a certain degree of camaraderie with them probably because of that color line. Uh, that's true, although there were certain women who, um, <laughs> there were, you know, there were a lot of very progressive people uh, back then who did find a way even at the risk of uh, drawing social ire um, to make personal relationships and invite the women to their homes and see them socially. I mean, it, it certainly wasn't everyone or even close to it, but um, there, there were, you know, there were some real progressive people there working at NASA. One of the things I loved about the book is the friendship and the way that they all leaned on each other and that they, that truly, they practiced that mantra also, that if we don't work together, we're not going to get as far as we could possibly go. We have questions from um, members of the University of Minnesota community. Can I include some of these in our conversation, Absolutely. please? This is from Kathy Olson, um, and this comes to us via Facebook. She says, Katherine Johnson was recognized as exceptional while she, was a, while she was a young girl in school and provided an opportunity to advance in her education. In this current era, where education is not only underfunded but also undervalued, how do we make education and being educated something to strive for and be proud of. And as I ask this question, I think of something that uh, the New York Times reporter, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, once tweeted, and it's always stuck in my mind. She says, it's quite possible that the person who is best qualified, at least in terms of intellect, potential intellect, to find a cure for cancer is stuck in a struggling public school somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So her question, how do we make education and being educated something to strive for and to be proud of, and how do we actually move education to the top of the national agenda? I mean, one, one of the things I think is that we have to see education as everyone's problem. You know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's sufficient for people who live in places with excellent public schools or private schools, the wherewithal to send their kids to private schools, to assume that that's the end of their responsibility. Um, you know, education <laughs> benefits all of us. Having an educated population is something, you know, the benef that benefits all of us, and we all pay the cost, whether it's an explicit cost 
or at an implicit cost mm -hmm. um, when we don't deliver on that to all of our, our, our children. So I, I think part of it really has to be that it is a shared responsibility and not just one of, I have mine and you get yours. That, that's not good enough. Uh, thank you, Kat, Kathy, for that question. This is from Maria Arboleda. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Arboleda. And she says, she's uh, from Minneapolis, and she asks, what can we as a society do to change the perspective that exists regarding women of color? That we are not motivated, that we are not leaders, that we can't be successful in fields like math, science, technology, and entrepreneurship, when we know so many women have been the backbone of so many successful projects that exist today. And as I read this question, I think about many scenes in the book where these women stood up for themselves. And to do so is sometimes difficult because you are labeled as someone who has a little bit of an attitude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you might be labeled as that person who is perhaps the angry woman of color. <laughs> so how do you walk that, she's, she's asking, how do you walk that fine line when we know that so many women have been the backbone of successful projects, some of them known and many of them hidden, as you write in this book. I think she should pick up a pen and start writing. I mean, the, <laughs> she's, she is obviously someone who knows what we all know, which is that there is a rich history. There are many talented people everywhere. Um, but we have to tell the stories, you know? If somebody like her, thinks that it is her responsibility to tell the story, then there is no one better to tell the story. You know, she, I think, I really, you know, when I said that I, I didn't understand how powerful it is to tell a story, I really did not understand how powerful it is to tell a story. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is almost a magical thing that happens when you see something and you put it together not just as facts, but as a story. You know, I mean, we process information, we remember information so much better if it's in a story form. And I think that we have to tell those stories, you know, until we have the entire spectrum of black experience, not just this tiny slice or tiny slices, which is usually one, you know, awful extreme and one first and only exceptional extreme when most of life happens in the middle. Yeah. The power of narrative. The power of narrative. And I, I certainly see that in, in the work that I do. And much like uh, Zora Neale Hurston mm -hmm. was an author, but she was also a, an anthropologist. Yes. And when she went to the South, she realized that it was hard for her to get people to share their stories, but if she gave them a story, they gave her a story. Mm -hmm. And so by giving us a story, it makes perhaps it makes it easier, perhaps, for people to share their own stories. And I guess that um, is a preamble to the question from Hannah Youngquist, <laughs> who apparently is in the audience. Um, and she is an undergraduate student at the college of, in the College of Liberal Arts here at the University of Minnesota. She says, what advice would you give to students who want to do recuperative history? I like that phrase, recuperative history, like hidden figures, in their own fields. What questions should they ask? Is there any institution too big or too small to challenge the way Hidden Figures challenges us to look at NASA? There is nothing too small and nothing too big for a good story. Um, so Hidden Figures, I mean, I, I really loved doing the work, um, this recuperative history. And it really was recuperative history. You know, it's like little bits and pieces of the story were everywhere. They were in National Archives and the NASA Archives and, you know, the archives of, of federal agencies that haven't existed for 50 years. You know, and I go to the archives and I, you know, the, the guy would bring up this box that had obviously been waterlogged and I was the first person to look at these documents since the box had been, you know, taken out of whatever agency it was. Um, you know, it was, they're just pieces of, of like bringing people to life, you know, which is really what this is, bringing their stories and their lives back to us. Um, you know, there, there is so much satisfying work there, and there's so much need for that. You know, there are so many different stories out there um, that will benefit from the talents of somebody like this who is, who's, 
patient enough and curious enough to sort of sift through you know, these tiny little pieces of history in a lot of different places and bring them back to life so that we can enjoy that work. So, um, so it can be tedious, but keep going. It is, it it's is, worth the time. you know, it is, it is tedious, but it is so, it is, it is a delightful process, you know, to spend that time, to, to get into a time capsule, you know, really to get into a time capsule and to transport yourself back to 1943 or 1933 or, you know, whatever it is, 1733, through the, these bits and pieces of, of documents and, and other people's lives. And you're, it is, it is such an imaginative work, you know? I mean, it, it is, I found it to be uh, just so incredibly creative. And if I, if I didn't have to deliver a book, I would still be in the archive. <laughs> <laughs> so the clock is telling us that we're out of time, so I'm just gonna ask two very quick questions. Um, first from Maram Falk, what did you find most surprising in your, in your research? One thing that you found most surprising? How many women there were. This is not a story of first and onlys. There were so many women, and they were doing research. They weren't just occupying seats in an office. Um, you know, these women rolled up their sleeves, and they were absolutely critical to the work that was being done. And you say in the book that if you had more time, you think you could probably have found 25, 30 more of them. I, I'm really, what I'm trying to do now is really identify as many of them, of all of the women, not just the black women, all of the women, and really trying to get a grip on the numbers of who they were, you know, how many there were, where they were working, what they were doing. And Jamie Walters, who's an undergraduate student here at, at the U, University of Minnesota, wants to know, will there be a Hidden Figures 2 in the works exploring another incredible untold story in history? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I am actually in the process of working on the next two books. Um, <laughs> So Hidden Figures is part of a trilogy. I, I found, um, I mean, I found, gosh, I don't even know how many stories I found. There were so many stories, but um, there were two in particular that kind of captured my imagination. Um, neither of them have to do, well, one of them kind of does have to do with science, um, and it has an international angle. Um, the other really looks at African Americans in business um, and entrepreneurship, the same way this one looked at science. Um, they all take place mid-century, which is a time period I'm really fascinated by, and they all have to do with race and identity and work and social mobility. Um, so the next thing is in the works. <laughs> Margo, thank you so much for birthing this story. Thank you very much for bringing it to us. You should know that there's an effort to make sure that hidden figures will be distributed to high schools around the country. Wow. That the studio system is, is working very hard to do that. So thank you very much. And I think, if I'm allowed to speak for both of us, I think that we want you all to look for the hidden figures in your own lives. Absolutely. And capture their stories, record them for posterity. It is part of your wealth. Thank you very much. Thank you.